Hello, everyone. Today's presenter has done something all of us probably have dreamed about doing. After 15 years in a corporate life, after going through school and doing a lot of things we all do, he said to himself and to his wife, is this what we really want to do? And then he didn't. He went to Mexico and has developed a way to share that dream with you. Rick now lives in Mexico and he has written articles about flying in Mexico and runs a service where he can actually escort you to Mexico. It's a beautiful country and it's one right near our borders that makes flying that much more exciting. Please welcome Rick Gardner. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, I'd like to thank O.B. Young, the FAA, and the uh, crew of volunteers here at the FAA Production Studios for this opportunity. I'd like to thank all of you for coming this afternoon to listen to the presentation. Uh, we've got a lot of information for you, uh, so I'd like to ask that we try to hold questions uh, till the end. So bring your seat backs to the full upright and locked position. Fasten your seat belts. We're clear for takeoff, and we're going to Mexico. A little bit about us, uh, the agenda, we're going to cover a little bit about us, some facts about Mexico, and then we're going to get into the procedures, which is the heart of the presentation. And then I'm going to take you on a little tour of southeast Mexico, which is where we call home, and then give you an overview of some services that are available for pilots visiting Mexico, and then have some time for questions and answers. Um, I'm actually from Nassau, Bahamas. Uh, my wife is Mexican from uh, Puebla, Mexico, uh, and we are based in Cancun. Now, we've made that sacrifice for you fellow pilots that we've done this so that we can provide you with uh, all of this good information. We're both bilingual, uh, which helps tremendously in communication uh, in Mexico. Uh, flying has been my passion, uh, always has been. And uh, I've uh, had the opportunity to be uh, put on the General Aviation Council in Mexico, which gives us uh, tremendous uh, access and a good relationship with the federal authorities there. And I'm also on the Bahamas General Aviation Council, so uh, we're very proud of that. And we're proud to be a resource for uh, AOPA uh, when technical issues or questions rise uh, or members have problems, they uh, contact us and we help uh, any way that we can. Some interesting facts about Mexico. 6,000 nautical miles of coastline, uh, which includes the Pacific, Gulf, and Caribbean coast. So there's three completely different types of, uh, of beaches and coasts. Second largest barrier reef in the world. And they've got about 1,300 airports. The only problem is only 92 of them are in the aeronautical information publication for Mexico. There's no AFD. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about one of the things that we've done to try to address that. 75 EORs, most of them work most of the time, and uh, the altimeter settings are in inches, uh, altitude is in feet, distance is in nautical miles, but fuel is in liters. So uh, be prepared to uh, convert if you're going to Mexico because uh, they don't use gallons. Uh, but ATC does speak English, does speak, I don't, but the ATC does. <laughs> And uh, it, a lot of questions that we get from pilots are just that, is how do I communicate? They speak English, some better than others, but very understandable. Um, Gilberto Lopez Mayer, who is a pilot uh, and is the director of Mexico's civil aviation or, uh, organization, the DGAC, uh, has made a commitment to continue to facilitate the arrival of general aviation pilots to Mexico, uh, the committee that I'm on. Uh, we are looking at ways to simplify and continue to streamline the process even further. Uh, but we do have the support of the top guy of Mexico's FAA, which is uh, very important. Now, having grown up in the Bahamas and living in Mexico for many, many years, uh, one of the things that I have found that helps to make your trip successful, uh, any international trip for that matter, is relax. Uh, don't set yourself uh, a, an aggressive agenda, timetable, don't expect quick turns. Just take it easy, build in plenty of time, and things will, be, uh, will go much more smoothly. Now, as far as documents are concerned, to travel to Mexico from the U.S., you need all of the documents that uh, you would need to fly in the United States with the addition of the restricted radio operator permit. And this is a topic that always gets a lot of discussion. Uh, it's actually an FCC regulation, and if you go to uh, the links page of our website, it takes you right to where they say that you've got to have it. Now, getting a restricted radio operator uh, permit is a grueling process, but if you can spell your name, uh, 
remember your address and fill out your credit card information and other similar devious tricky questions, you will have passed the requirements to obtain a restricted radio operator permit. So it's really not that tough. Passenger documents, the United States uh, Customs and Border Protection now requires U.S. citizens to re-enter the United States from Mexico and the Caribbean to have a passport. Mexico doesn't care. They'll keep serving you margaritas, but if you want to go home, you will need a passport, so you'll need to get one. And if you're traveling with minors uh, and one of the parents is not traveling, get a notarized letter uh, from the, uh, the parent not traveling. Aircraft, the same thing you need to fly in the United States with the addition of the uh, radio station permit. Again, if you go to our website, there's a link that takes you to uh, uh, the FCC website where you can get that information. Insurance coverage in Mexico, this is another topic where there's a lot of conflicting and misleading information. Around 2003, Mexico changed the requirement, and now your U.S.-issued insurance is valid in Mexico provided three things. One, that it specifically states in the geographic coverage that you're covered in Mexico. And number two, there's a formula. It's 56,900 days of minimum wage, on and on and on, but it's basically $250,000. So if your liability insurance, your liability coverage is at least 250,000 US or greater, that covers the second requirement. They don't care about hull, it's the liability. And the third thing is you need to bring a photocopy specifically of those pages that show those first two items because you'll need to leave that with your entry permit when you arrive. Notarized if your aircraft is borrowed or you've created a corporation, just whoever owns the aircraft, bring a notarized letter authorizing you to fly it on those dates. And before you leave, I recommend you try to get the Customs and Border Protection decal. You, you can get it upon arrival, but it's just one other thing you're going to have to deal with. So plan ahead. Go to our website. You can, there's a link to take you there, uh, and you can obtain your CBP decal uh, before you depart. And if you're going to use ferry tanks, you'll need your 337. Navigation charts. As simple as this sounds, you'd believe, you wouldn't believe the number of times I've run into pilots in Cancun or other, other places trying to travel within Mexico or across to other countries, and they don't even have charts. They're using their, their GPS or something, and they don't have uh, current charts. Uh, so make sure you, you do bring them. To cross the uh, air defense identification zone, we need 12-inch numbers and a mode C transponder and a radio to contact ATC. And although the FARs don't necessarily require you on a private flight to carry life jackets or a life raft, I strongly urge you, if you're going to be over water, there's lots of places that rent life jackets and life rafts. Do it, folks. It's, um, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's very little expense and a tremendous uh, safety equipment that you can have on board. And of course, your survival equipment uh, adequate to the uh, terrain. Oil and spare parts. Uh, getting oil and parts in Mexico can be somewhat challenging, especially if you use a specific type of oil. So if space and weight uh, allow, I encourage you to uh, bring it with you. When I bought the 206 that we fly, I saw the previous owner had changed the starter two times. And I thought, okay, I know what I'm going to get. First thing I did was buy a brand new starter. For four years now, I've been hauling it around in the back of my plane. It's like Murphy's Law in reverse, you know, and if I hadn't got it, I would be in the jungle somewhere uh, wishing I had. And any country you go to, uh, I think it's prudent. Even in the U.S., I put my throttle lock on. Uh, I think it's, uh, just, you sh it's prudent to have it. Uh, in our neck of the woods, we've not had any thefts or break-ins, but it's always good to do. But what you don't want to bring to Mexico, do not want to bring firearms, ammunition, or any illegal drugs. That's a big no-no. Now to cross, uh, to depart the southeast of the United States towards our neck of the woods, we've got to cross the air defense identification zone. And Part 99 tells us that unless un otherwise authorized, no person may operate an aircraft into, within, or across an ATIS unless that person has filed a flight plan. And also in Part 91, it tells us to fly to Mexico, we've got to file. So we've got to file a flight plan. So what you want to do is you want to select the Mexican airport of entry. Uh, and I'm going to show you one of the places you can find uh, what those are. But you want to select an airport of entry. It doesn't have to be at first border crossing or first coastline crossing. It can be 500 miles inland. They don't care. All they want you to do is that first landing is to be at an airport of entry. File a flight plan. Now, coming out of Florida, you'll be filing an ICAO international flight plan. Miami Flight Service will help you prepare that. Um, and it, but if you cross into Mexico from the border, there is a, uh, an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico, and you actually can file a domestic flight plan if you're departing Texas, Arizona, into Mexico. So beware that if you're accustomed to crossing at the border and you come down to South Florida and try to go across from here, the process is different and the flight plan is different. 
then make sure you activate your flight plan. Uh, you can ask for flight following. Havana Center provides it. Then the Mexican centers provide it. I encourage you to do that. Mexico requests that when you cross their borders or their coastline, you contact the nearest tower approach or center and identify yourself and who you are and where you're going. Okay? It's also good for, um, for uh, safety so that somebody knows where you are if you're VFR. And then close the flight plan. In the case of Mexico, they do it automatically upon arrival. Um, coming across from Key West, there's a number of different routes. The three most popular points are Merida, Cancun, and uh, Cozumel. And uh, some of the, uh, for those of you that are IFR, Canoa, uh, Vinca, the two critical intersections outbound, and then pick the appropriate airway from then on. But what you don't want to do if you're VFR is you don't want to go inside the Cuban a inner ATIS, that 12 mile zone, unless you're in contact with Havana Center, they've approved, they've given you clearance, and they've given you a discrete transponder code. Okay? And sometimes they will do that um, if you're VFR. But what you don't want to do is make any unauthorized stops prior to an airport of entry because they will assume that you were doing that to drop off some type of uh, illegal contraband. So uh, if you're flying, let's say you're flying from uh, Key West and you're flying to Merida and you have a problem, somebody needs to go to the restroom, whatever, something happens that you can't make it, then pick another airport of entry, pick Cancun, pick Cozumel, pick something else but try to avoid landing. Of course, if it's an emergency, you've got to do what you've got to do, but if you can certainly pick another airport of entry, that's what you should do. And then again, don't cross that 12-mile um, uh, ATIS, the inner ATIS of Cuba, unless you've been cleared to do so. Okay? When you arrive in Mexico, you will more than likely be greeted by a soldier. Uh, the uh, Mexican Army, and in some cases the Navy, but typically the Army, has been empowered to provide security at most airports. So guy's going to come out, and he's not going to speak real good English, if at all. Now we have in our pilot guide a little page, a cheat sheet that you can fill in with your information, hand it to him, and uh, he'll copy it down and give it back. But basically they want to know where you're coming from, where you're going, and the names of the people on board uh, your aircraft. And once you've uh, passed that step, then the entry process is very similar uh, to that in the Bahamas. Uh, for those of you that have flown to the Bahamas, you've got to complete the general declaration, uh, an immigration form. Now, in the case of Mexico, they tear off the bottom part of the form and they give it to you. Don't lose it. That just shows that you entered the country legally and they're going to ask you for that when you depart. Just as if when you fly commercial, those of you that have flown to Mexico on commercial airlines, the next step is the customs declaration, one per family, again, just as if you were flying commercial. And then the entry permit. Um, there are two types of entry permits into Mexico. There's a one-time entry permit that costs 567 pesos, which is about 50, 50, $55. And then there's a multiple entry permit that allows you to enter Mexico as many times as you want during the calendar year, which costs 567 pesos which prompts the obvious question, why wouldn't you get a multiple entry permit? I don't know, but I suggest you do. Uh, the multiple entry permit uh, is a two-page letter. Uh, basically says you can fly within Mexico, but you can't uh, uh, do any commercial operations, and a receipt. In either case, if you get a one-time or a multiple entry, you will, you will receive a form that's called a GHC-001. The GHC-001 is similar to the C-7A in the Bahamas. It's the one you take with you on the aircraft. But the most important thing is that those three blocks are stamped by immigration, customs, and civil aviation. Okay? Uh, there's the reason for the GHC is that. It basically says these are the three federal entities that recognize this form. So whatever you do, you want to make sure that you leave the airport with that form. Okay, in the north, some, uh, some pilots refer to that as the green sheet. Many years ago, they used to be green. And then complete an arrival report, just as you would, say, in Freeport or Nassau, Bahamas, any towered airport in the Bahamas, where there's only two, you fill out an arrival, port, uh, arrival report, Mexico is the same. So that's the entry process, very similar to the Bahamas, and you're there. So it's time for your uh, margarita or your corona on the beach. Now, once you've entered, uh, Mexico has a lot to offer. And so you'll need to get around, navigate. You'll probably need fuel. So here's a tip. 100 LL, and it is 100 LL, it's blue, is called gas avion, which is actually avgas in Spanish. Gas avion, avgas. And jet A is called turbocina. So remember those two words. So when you need fuel, say, I need gas avion, and they're going to know exactly what you're talking about. 
Typically, they're provided by ASA, which is a part of the, the Mexican government. They drive these uh, bright yellow trucks. And I recommend if there's an FBO on the field, pay ASA directly, because many FBOs mark it up 20, 30%, and it's still ASA fueling your plane. All they're doing is financing you at a very steep price. So you can pay these guys directly without having to go through the FBO. They accept pesos, many times credit cards, um, and uh, right now it's running about $3.20 a gallon for Avgas. I just fueled our 206. Getting weather in Mexico uh, is uh, done by CENAM. CENAM is a branch of the government similar to ATC in the United States. The DGAC is the administrative part. They handle permits, uh, administrative functions. CENAM are your tower controllers, briefers, uh, radar operators. So they both report into the Secretaría de Comunicaciones y Transporte, their uh, transportation and communications um, division of the federal government. And at some airports they have, like the old flight service stations, where you walk up to the briefer, they'll give you your weather, you file your flight plan with them just as we used to do uh, years ago. And they also have some RCOs uh, for in-flight weather, and we've got a chart where we show uh, what those are. Unfortunately, those aren't published, uh, but we do have them in our uh, pilot guide. Then, of course, there's public and private resources uh, available, uh, most of you know. And then uh, we'll be talking about this. We have some free weather information off of our website. Uh, Mexico has prohibited airspace and restricted, just like in the United States. The only difference you'll see, they start with Mike Mike. That's the only thing, when you look at charts, that's all it is, it's just saying it's Mexican restricted airspace. Uh, CTA is center, and uh, rather than Class D airspace, or what we call Class D around towered airports, they have aerodrome traffic zones, uh, ATZ. So if you look at a JEP chart, you see an ATZ, what's that? It's Class D, just think of it as Class D airspace in the U.S., because it is, um, and you'll need to get clearance into the uh, ATZ just as you would into Class D airspace here. The other thing that they have are TMAs. Now these are terminal control areas. Where the M comes from, I have no idea. We'll need to ask the folks up in uh, Montreal at ICAO what that is, but it's what we know as a TCA. And all you need to know is that you need clearance to get into it, uh, to enter it. Now they look ominously like Class Bravo. Uh, I have never known, I've personally never been denied nor know of anyone that has been denied access into a TMA. Uh, what happens is many airports don't have radar and so consequently what they do is they want to know where everybody is and that's why they want you to report, especially if there's a lot of commercial traffic. They want to know where everybody is so they can maintain VFR and IFR separation and they do a lot of traffic reporting. So uh, just make sure you get clearance. There's also another strange creature called an APHIS. Uh, Aerodrome Flight Information Service, and it's similar to the LAAs in the U.S. where basically it's someone from CENAM, someone from flight services on the field on a discrete frequency that can help you with traffic and weather information. Uh, just beware that some APHISs or some uncontrolled airports may underlie a TMA so that when you depart, again, you need to, if you want to enter the TMA, uh, you need to contact and get a clearance in. Otherwise, you can just fly underneath it uh, without having to talk to them. One thing that's uh, different uh, in Mex uh, outside the U.S. is that uh, s uh, VFR flight is not allowed after sunset. So no night VFR, it's just like in the Bahamas. And I'm going to tell you, if you've ever been out in the ocean at night, or if you've been out over the jungle at night, there is no horizon. So it makes, uh, from a safety standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, basic VFR in Mexico is a little bit, the, the uh, ceiling's just a little higher than what we're accustomed to. And here's an important one. The official CTAF for airports in Mexico is 122.5. However, as you get closer to the U.S. border, you'll find 122.8 becomes more and more popular. And I think it's just basically because of the, uh, si the uh, proximity to the United States. Uh, Left-hand traffic patterns predominate. Cardinal altitudes, just a little lower if you're fortunate to have a turbine, speech restrictions are a little different. We've got those in our guide. Uh, and again, if you file the flight plan, you need to follow it unless you advise ATC uh, that you're changing, uh, modifying your flight plan. In Mexico, if you depart a towered airport and some non-towered airports, even if you're VFR, you'll need to file a flight plan. Uh, and they use the ICAO flight plan format. And it needs to get the DGAC approval. Now, uh, we are rolling out at a number of airports and continuing to roll out. Um, 
a telephone uh, radio version of this where rather than have to fill out all the papers and get the stamps, you can actually call in or radio from your aircraft saying, I'd like to file a flight plan from Cancun to Chichen Itza. And they'll start giving, asking you the information and they'll say, flight plan received, contact tower for departure. No paper, no stamps, no fuss. Uh, and same for the arrival. I've arrived from Cozumel, I'd like to close my flight plan. And you, you'll be queried for the information and, uh, and you're done, okay? So that's, it's really pretty straightforward uh, getting in and flying within, uh, except for the, the flight plan piece and we're working to make that easier. Uh, but when it gets time to go home, you need to plan your return. And, uh, and here we need to pay special attention because after 9-11, things have gotten a little bit more uh, delicate. You need to select a Mexican AOE for de departure. Your, the Mexican regulations say the last departure from Mexico should be from an airport of entry. And I know there's a lot of uh, misleading information. I can tell you the, the immigration law, just like our laws in the U.S., clearly says that. Um, it's in the law. So make sure your last departure is from an airport of entry. They're going to ask for that uh, GHC-001. They're going to ask for your immigration card back. And then you need to select a U.S. Customs and Border Protection designated airport for arrival. Um, and there they want you to land at the closest uh, AOE or designated airport to border or coastline crossing. So if you're flying back to the U.S. from Cancun, you can't overfly Key West up over Naples and land in Tampa. They will, you will not be very popular when you arrive. Uh, so you need to land in Key West, clear in Key West, and then continue on. If you're coming in from the Bahamas, obviously one of the East Coast airports, uh, the appropriate one for your route. You'll need to determine your route, ETA, and the aid is time. They're going to ask you for that uh, when you file your flight plan. Um, now here's a tip for those of you that are IFR certified. There is one airway over Cuba, an airspace, uh, that you can fly without an overflight permit. If you're departing Cancun or Cozumel, you can file direct MISIS, it's actually Upper Juliet 18 MISIS, and, ca and uh, intercept Green 765. It's an NDB airway, uh, goes from Cozumel direct to Fishhook, NDB, and, and Key West. And there is a, an agreement between Havana Center and Merida Center that for IFR routing, you don't need an overflight permit. So if you're in a single, and you are IFR certified, you may want to make that return IFR, and that way it puts you within just a few miles of the Cuban coast. Beautiful view, uh, and puts you much closer to land. Also, if you are coming down IFR, uh, and you, once you reach Kanoa, and you're talking to Havana Center, I always start asking direct NOSAT, or where, wherever the, the fear boundary point, to cut off having to go to Vinca. So if I'm going to Cozumel, I might start asking for direct, uh, I think it's uh, NUCAN for Cozumel, where, it, where the Havana Center and Merida Center uh, airspaces meet. So just little tips there to cut off uh, the distance. Call flight service. CENIAM does not have access to local NOTAMs, and also I would be concerned if I was VFR about any TFRs uh, in the Key West area, for example. So it always is a good idea, call flight service, get a briefing from them. Now depending upon whether you're re-entering the U.S. Into, uh, from, uh, into Florida or on the border, they may even allow you to file a DVFR flight plan to speed up getting that transponder code, that uh, squat code. Miami is a little bit uh, more uh, hesitant about doing that, let's say. Uh, because they, they're correct saying the I Mexican ICAO flight plan is the legal flight plan that you're under. But on the border, uh, many flight service stations allow you to place basically a duplicate flight plan to be able to cross the ATIS and get the transponder code. So if they let you do it, take advantage of it. The key thing is talk to flight service and get a briefing. Uh, and then call Customs and Border Protection. They've gotten a little bit picky. Before, a lot of times we just put ADCUS in the remarks section and then flight service would call. Uh, some ports have gotten a little bit more uh, demanding and they want the pilots to call directly. Uh, so I suggest don't get caught in the middle of that. Call CBP and get a name, a badge number, or the initials of whoever you spoke to because it has happened to me. I've called, I've done everything, I've arrived, and I get the look like I've got three eyes and gills. And you know, what are you doing here? And it turns out that who, who the fortune I had the person's name uh, had misentered the information. So once I gave the name, they looked it up. Sure enough, there I was. And then all of a sudden, everyone started smiling again. So 
Departing Mexico is, is just uh, is very straightforward. For those of you that fly to the Bahamas, it's, it's the, basically the same process. You need to file your flight plan, uh, in this case with CINAM. Don't forget to put ADCAS, it doesn't hurt. Complete a general deck, your outbound general declaration, and turn in that immigration form. And once you've done that, you're good to go, as far as the Mexican side is concerned. On the U.S. side, you need to file and activate your flight plan 15 minutes prior to crossing the ADIS. Now, uh, coming in from uh, Cancun into Florida, that can be a little challenging. I'm going to show you a little trick here. And you need to get that discrete transponder code, okay? That's the very important thing. They need to know who you are and where you are. Now, if you're arriving into South Florida from Mexico and you have a hard time, sometimes flight service is busy, and the RCO in Key West, uh, there's only a couple of frequencies there, and the, and the distance from the ATIS to Key West is, is considerable. Here's some tips. Try Miami Center. Uh, you can call them up, 133. Explain your situation. You're inbound. You're, tr you know, you're trying to get your, your code. You've got a VFR flight plan that's been activated. Try Havana Center. Havana Center is actually great to work with. They speak very good English, and they've been very accommodating. They could relay. They've got a landline to Miami Center. They can pick it up. Try Key West Approach, 12445. Uh, and worse comes to worse, there's a lot of commercial airline traffic up there. 1215, get an airliner, ask them to relay for you. Uh, and I've done that too. So there's lots of different avenues. Don't get uptight. Don't get nervous out there. There's many different ways of getting in contact with uh, the ATC in the US and letting them know who you are and where you're going. Now, when I arrive in uh, US airports, I always ask Customs and Border Protection, OK, if I, when I make these presentations, what would you like me to tell the pilot community? So let me tell you how to become really unpopular at Customs and Border Protection. Some of the airports have these big ramps in front of the building, OK? And some pilots like to pull in in their 182, right into the middle of the ramp, do a 90 degree turn, and shut down. And then what will happen is you're about halfway through your uh, procedures inside when the phone rings. And it's the tower saying, would somebody please move because I've got a citation out in the ramp who's blocking my taxiway because he can't get into yours. You will become very unpopular at that point with Customs and Border Protection. So what they like you to do is to come in, taxi to the edge of the ramp, if they've got spaces there, into one of the spaces, and then shut down. Okay? Some uh, CBP have these lanes. And what they want you to do is they want you to get into the lane and go all the way down to the end because they, uh, they do first in, first out. So they want you to go to the end so that when they're done with you, you pull out. The next guy behind you can pull out. Sometimes people come in and they just do a 90 degree and boom, there you are. They've blocked the whole lane because they really want you to be inside those boxes. I call them penalty boxes. Okay? So don't do that. Just go to the end of the lane, shut down. Um, the other thing that you want to do is don't let people start wandering around. As far as they're concerned, only the captain can get off of the airplane. Okay? Now, some airports will have signs that say, passengers, you know, crew and passengers, unload your baggage and proceed to the building. OK, great, do that. But if there's no sign, like in Key West, for example, they want you in that penalty box. And that can be a real problem if somebody has to go to the bathroom, if you've got little ones. So again, another reason to call Customs and Border Protection ahead of time and let them know exactly when you're coming. Once you're in, you'll need to fill out your forms, uh, the Customs Declaration, just as if you were flying commercial. And then your, um, your Form 178 is what we call it, the uh, Enforcement System Form. And we've got a link on our website where you can download those uh, and fill it out ahead of time. I found that there's a direct proportion or correlation between the more you have ready and the easier you make it for customs, the nicer and the faster it goes for you. It seems funny how that seems to work. But if you go in and you go, duh, I got nothing, you know, what do I do? What, you know, then it'll be a little longer. But I always try to go in, I always try to get a declaration for my next trip. I get a blank one, take it with me. I've got my 178. In fact, I put it into PowerPoint or Word. And, I fill in all the stuff that never changes, your address, your tail number, print out a bunch of those. Even if I always fly with my family, their names, and all you got to put is the date and the time. So there's a lot of things you can do. Just have blank ones with you. You know your takeoff time, fill it in, and, and it just saves you a lot of time. And if you were VFR, don't forget to uh, close your flight plan. So again, the key thing here is don't, when you arrive, you still have not legally entered the United States. So don't let people start running around in different directions. Go, don't go talking to other people you recognize on the ramp that are coming in. 
they get really upset about people doing that. So again, there's no signs, stay in the penalty box, uh, but if there are signs, then do as instructed. Some safety tips. Um, what I tell folks is it's better to have a bad plan than no plan at all. Okay? Some people, like I've told you earlier, you know, go out there, no charts, nothing, don't have a plan. They just woke up one day and said, I'm going to go to uh, Cozumel and off we go with my Garmin 396. Uh, have a good plan, or at least have a plan. Um, I recommend strongly the PLBs. Uh, I've no, I saw that we've got some great deals here at Sun and Fun on them. Uh, they're great over water, over land, anywhere you go. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, I encourage you to go find out more about them. They're terrific. A GPS with a moving map. If you've ever been out over the ocean or over the jungle, uh, there's not a whole lot of pilotage you can do because there's no landmarks unless you can tell one way from another. There's really nothing to go by. And a lot of times people start getting this little voice in the back of their minds that haven't done this before. Am I going where I think I'm going? You know, geez, I should have seen this land by now. All those little thoughts start to go through your head. If you have a GPS, it can really help uh, allay your fears. Life jackets and a life raft, there's many FBOs that rent them. I encourage you to get them because it's the best insurance you can have. It's kind of like Murphy's Law in reverse. I've got mine in my plane, never had to use it. Pack a machete and survival equipment, especially if you're over the jungle. Make sure you've got appropriate equipment. And over water, here's another tip. What I do when I'm over water, if I see a ship, I just hold the enter key on my GPS. You know, you do the uh, waypoint, it does a, the uh, current waypoint, and just program it in. So if I had a problem, what I have to do is hit my, uh, um, my nearest button, nearest user waypoint. That's going to be where it's going to take me. Now, if you see a freighter and then you see a Royal Caribbean cruise ship, here's another important tip. Pick the cruise ship. They got the food. They got the entertainment. You don't want to be with those guys on the freighter. So that's the one you want to take, uh, take note of. And also other aircraft. 121.5, the commercial guys do a good job of monitoring, uh, monitoring guard. I always do, and I encourage you to do that, uh, do so as well. Try to get another aircraft. And if you're over land, remember, Mexico only has two CTAFs. So 120, you can't get anyone 121.5. Chances are you might get someone on 122.5 or 122.8. ICAO English is a little bit different from what we're accustomed to. Uh, here's a trick question. What does, uh, somebody want to tell me what this means? Taxi to holding point. Means taxi to runway 11. Okay? Taxi and hold short. I've been in situations where people have mis uh, misunderstood that as taxi into position and hold. So this is basically taxi to runway, cross all runways and taxiways, but don't enter across the active runway. Line up and wait is taxi into position and hold. Doesn't mean go to McDonald's and get a fry. It's just taxi into position and hold. But whatever, always ask for clarification. If there's ever any doubt in your mind whatsoever, stop and ask for clarification. They aren't going to get upset. Make position reports if you're VFR. Uh, they have microwave uh, and landlines connecting the towers. So when you're en route, if you, especially if you took off from a non-towered airport and you're going to a non-towered airport, well, you probably didn't file a flight plan because there was no one there to take it and there's no one there to know that you got there. So contact the tower and just say, hey, I just took off from uh, Playa del Carmen and I'm headed to Cojun Leach. And what they'll do is they'll net, let the next tower. So once you're out of radio range, they'll say, you know, frequency change approved. Contact Chetumal Tower 50 miles out and, let, you know, and report. And that way somebody knows where you are and what you're, what you're doing. Flight following is available, Merida Center, Mexico Center, Mazatlan, all of those guys will provide it. So uh, I encourage you to take advantage of it. And get as much as done on the ramp. There's very few airports have parallel taxiways. It's basically a runway and a ramp. And there's nothing worse than being in a foreign country. You're already probably a little bit nervous if you've not done this before. And you're sitting there holding short, and then you hear turbines behind you. You know, somebody's, you know, and then you get even more nervous. So try to get as much done on the ramp as possible so that you can be more relaxed. Use your checklist. Again, when you get nervous, you tend to overlook things. So just, just a tip. Verify airport data and conditions. Uh, again, sounds pretty straightforward, but uh, sometimes in the, in the nervousness, we forget to do so. And overfly runways of non-towered airports before landing. So... Uh, we're going to have a little quiz now, and I'm going to ask uh, all of you to participate. And the quiz is, can you identify which one of these runways are open? All right, hands for open. 
No hand. This was an easy one. That one's pretty obvious. How about this one? Open or close? How, can I see hands for open? Okay, about half the room. It's open. Very good. How about this one? Hands up for open? Uh, about half the room. It's actually closed. There's actually ditches dug across this runway. Not uh, conducive to a smooth landing, unless you're me. All my landings are bad, but certainly uh, it won't help yours. Open or closed? Hands up for open. All right. Very good. And last, open or closed? Hands up for open. And about a third of the room. There's actually a nylon rope and a steel pipe sticking out of the middle of that runway. Uh, and the point with this, folks, is from traffic pattern, many times you can't see these things. So what I do, and in fact the Mexican regs encourage you to do, is overfly the runway at 500 feet. What I do is I'm offset to the right so I can see the runway out my window, 20 degrees of flaps or whatever the appropriate uh, go around position is. I configure, slow the plane down, get my flap setting, and then I fly the right edge of the runway and I look at that entire runway and make sure it's clear of any obstacles. Another tip, make your, run, your landing short. Many of these runways that we use on our trips are 3,000 feet. I treat them all as a short field. You never know when a dog or a goat or a cow or something might come out of the bushes. So I treat all my landings as short field just to minimize my time uh, rolling out. Airborne weather, uh, there's a number of ways to do that. From CNAM, uh, you can also get them from ATC, ask a tower or a, or a uh, radar uh, operator. And other aircraft, Mexico's got a very modern fleet of commercial aircraft, Mexicanero, Mexico, uh, and the, the pilots are great guys and, and gals. They, they're re real uh, um, great to work with, and they'll be more than glad. If, if they're anywhere near, they're on an airway, they'll say, I'm flying west of many of them 20 miles out, and weather looks good, or I'm painting a cell 10 degrees to the left, of course. They can, they'll be glad to share that with you. And then there are some RCOs. Unfortunately, they're not published, but and this is one of the advantages of being from there, living there for so many years um, and being in, involved in the aviation. And what we've done in our pilot guide, we've got a chart where we've tried to show you where you can actually talk to a weather briefer in the air and get information. So if you're coming in from Brownsville, Texas, headed to Veracruz, you can talk to Victoria Dispatch and they can look up new METAR TAF information for Veracruz and all the airports along the way. Another thing we recommend, fly higher, it's cooler, more gliding distance, better communications range. Uh, early in the day, try to avoid the convective activity in the afternoon, uh, especially, you know, we're in the tropics here. Consider terrain. There are peaks in Mexico up to 18,000 plus feet, uh, so unless you are a turbine or have a turbocharger, um, those could be uh, somewhat challenging. And density altitudes, there are a lot of places in Mexico that are high and hot, so make sure you take density altitude uh, into consideration when you plan. And always plan on an alternate. As I said, there's few airports have a parallel taxiway, so there's nothing worse than being low on fuel and having a stranded aircraft on the runway. That could really ruin your day. So I always, even if I'm VFR and it is completely, you know, clear day, I always plan on an alternate just in case. And one of the things that we spent most of last year working on, and they're in the printer, uh, they're coming out mañana, is uh, Mexico WAC charts. This is important, folks, because the DOD charts are going away. The ONCs and the low altitude and route stuff uh, after October, they're gone. Uh, so this is very, very important for traveling to Mexico, uh, and we should have them before October. Other resources, one of the best resources I've found is right here, the FAA Production Studios. If you get on their website and look at their catalog, there's a a wealth of information on survival, ditching, all sorts of stuff, depending on whether you're flying over land, over water. There's lots of important stuff, and I encourage you to use it. Uh, and then a number of other uh, websites uh, where you can uh, obtain good information. Well, now I'd like to quickly take you on a tour of where we call home, uh, which is the southeast Mexico, where we conduct guided uh, tours and uh, show you a little bit of the things that Mexico has to offer the general aviation community. Uh, there's tremendous colonial history, the uh, Spanish conquest of Mexico, uh, Veracruz, this is uh, San Juan de Ulua, the fort in Veracruz, which was uh, very important uh, in Mexico's early colonial history. They have a beautiful Zócalo, which is the city center square. Uh, at night, it's, it's beautiful, it's lit, there's all sorts of music, food, drink, it is, it's one, very, very uh, pleasant uh, place to, tr to visit in the evenings. 
uh, and of course Veracruz has its own unique folkloric history. The marimba, which is like a xylophone that makes a rattling noise, is about the only way I know to describe it. But you've got them all over the place. You can see here, and they go. You'll you'll be you grab yourself a little table, and they bring your food to you. They bring you your margaritas, your coronas, and these guys go up and down. And they play you a song. They ask you what do you want to hear, and they'll play you something nice. Tremendous architecture uh, in the city of Veracruz. Another one of our favorite stops is the city of Campeche. And Campeche was walled by the Spanish to protect it from the pirates because it was a key point of trade. And much of that wall is still there. You can still see it uh, and uh, the bulwarks to protect it. You can see the, the, the city uh, center is in the background. Uh, the bulwarks where the uh, troops were, uh, were garrisoned to uh, protect them. And then, of course, the Socalo of Campeche. It's a fabulous place to walk around in the evening and visit, explore. Uh, beautiful, one of our favorite, personal favorites. And many little boutique hotels that we have found uh, that are truly remarkable. Outside the city, you have forts that are still there. They've been turned into museums that you can visit and tour uh, and climb up and let the kids run around and burn off some energy. And then there's Merida, which is another uh, well-known colonial city, a little bit further north, uh, the white city as it was known, uh, with spectacular architecture and uh, little uh, cafes, boutique, hotels uh, to visit. Outside of these colonial cities were uh, haciendas, and haciendas were estates, and they either raised cattle or they raised uh, eneken, which is sisal. And before nylon rope was invented, ropes were made out of sisal fibers. And these places cultivated the plant, they harvested them and brought them into the main buildings where they were processed. And of course with nylon, these all went away. And some of these uh, were, were turned into boutique hotels and some were just basically abandoned and shut down. And in the case of those that were shut down, this one, Yoshkupoi, which we visit, uh, ran up until the mid 80s. And they basically just flipped it off and locked the door. And so if you get there at the right time and get the caretaker and give him you know, 30 pesos, $3, $4, he'll get this big key ring off the wall and he's gonna take you on a tour. And you'll get to see the original machinery, just as it used to run. This is a single cylinder diesel engine. That flywheel is about as tall as I am. So you can imagine what that vibration must have been like. And the original machinery for combing the fibers and producing the sisal are all still there. So it's kind of a real life museum. And others have been turned into beautiful boutique hotels where you can go and pamper yourself, spend the weekend, relax, uh, and just completely get away from it all. Uh, it's a fabulous place. And then, of course, there's always shopping, my wife's favorite pastime, uh, and a lot of uh, folkloric dances, and Mexico wouldn't be Mexico without the mariachis. Archaeology is uh, another thing that's uh, very impressive in this part of Mexico. Uh, we've had lots of articles written about it, but there's numerous sites uh, to visit, uh, Tulum in this case, which is right on the Caribbean Sea, and many small airstrips located nearby. Palenque, which is one of our stops, uh, spectacular on the side of the Sierra Madre Mountains, and Uxmal, Adzna, Uxmal. And these are truly unique. And you see all the Carnival Cruise Line people there? With a small airplane, you can get to visit places and be the only people there. Uh, if you go to Chichen Itza after 10, 11 o'clock, forget it. Uh, you won't do it. But here I am with my two kids there in the foreground with one kid. My, my son's up with my wife taking the picture. Uh, and you can see this is a very typical day in Ushman. So you've got a small aircraft. We can show you how to do this. Uh, Ekbalam, as they uncovered these pyramids, uh, you know, people think of the Mayan pyramids as a pile of rocks. They were actually covered in either carved stone or stucco. And as they excavated Ekbalam, you can see they uncovered sections of the original exterior surface of the pyramid. So you can just give you an idea of the detail. Another popular place is Kohun Leach. It's not even on the charts, so don't look for it. Um, but we have access to this airstrip. And an another pyramid where you can see the original exterior, and you can even see the original paint. You can still see the red tint of the, uh, the, pi the pigment came from plant. The pigments that were used were plant-based. <coughs> Sivanche. And Itzamkanak, this is where they believe Hernán Cortés uh, had the last Aztec emperor, uh, Cuauhtémoc, assassinated. And again, we had the place to ourselves. So 
truly there's a wealth of things to do. Uh, this is another uh, interesting Shpukhil. You can see there's an archaeological site right off the runway. But it's our access point to Calakmul, which was the Tikal's rival in the Mayan world. There's over 6,000 structures, hundreds of stella, which are the carved ob obelisks, and right in the middle of the jungle. No lights, no, f no phones, no nothing. It's an hour and a half by car because the road's too narrow for buses. Um, but it's a spectacular place. It takes you back in time. You can almost imagine what it was like back then. So there's a tremendous wealth of um, Mayan archaeological uh, sites to visit. Natural beauty, Mexico's got a tremendous amount of, of uh, mountains, deserts, jungle, beaches, uh, you name it. Uh, but uh, these are some of the places that we go to visit on our tours, uh, the Candelaria River. Uh, it's got unique uh, structures underwater. There's different theories because this whole region is completely unexplored. No one really knows. They, some say that Hernan Cortes, these were the, the uh, foundations to bridges that he built. Others say these are Mayan dikes. No one really knows. What we do know is that this whole area is just wide open to those that have a small aircraft. Okay? Uh, we have the largest underground cave system uh, in the state of Quintana Roo with just some spectacular places to go visit. Uh, you, some are dry, some are wet. And uh, different caletas, beaches, some populated, some not. And, of course, swimming with the dolphins, deep sea fishing, scuba diving, uh, you name it. We've got it. Lots of wildlife. Uh, there's uh, many places in that place, Calakmul. There's jaguars, wild turkeys, all sorts of wild animals running around. Flamingos, my kids. And, uh, of course, in, in, in the Yucatan, the iguana is everywhere. Okay, last uh, topic on our destinations, we do some island hopping. And uh, Isla Mujeres has got a nice little runway that we use and tremendous nightlife. It's a great place to get away from it all and uh, just uh, relax and, and unwind, disconnect. Again, more shopping. Uh, then we go to more remote islands like the island of Olbosch, and this is one of our favorite getaways. Not a hotel in sight. See that beautiful beach for miles? Not a road, not a house, nothing. Uh, this is the island of Olbosch, and uh, this is where we go for our whale shark visits. The runway's been resurfaced and recompacted. It's 2,100 foot. Uh, it's in great condition. Uh, there's the international terminal of the Olbosch airport. Uh, and uh, there's no paved streets in Olbosch. You get around by foot or you get around in a golf cart. That's uh, the two modes of transportation. Uh, the hotel that we use, each hut is a little room. You're right there on the beach. The be wind breeze comes in off of the gulf. And Restaurante Pizzeria de Lin is our favorite for lobster pizza. Have you ever had lobster pizza? That's where to go. And this is the attraction on that trip is when we go out and swim with the whale sharks. No teeth. They don't have teeth, but they are filter feeding uh, animals. And we go out there with the fishermen in these small boats and uh, put on some snorkeling gear and uh, take a plunge. And those aren't sharks, they're dolphins. There's pods of dolphins everywhere around Olbosch. Dolphins, manta rays, and beautiful sunsets. Cozumel is another attraction. Of course, most of you are familiar with that. Uh, the beaches, the scuba diving are well known. We do catamaran tours as one of our group activities. And then this is our home, Cancun. Uh, and again, if you like to pamper yourself, there's plenty of places to do that on Cancun as well. Now, Mexico is a very child-friendly country. Many of the hotels we use have kids' clubs. And when we go with our kids, all they want is to go to the kids' club. And uh, they do a great job of keeping them entertained during the day and at night as well. If you want to find out more about this, uh, there was an article that was done by Pilot Getaways magazine. And we have some reprints of the article in our booth. We're in Hangar A, booth 80. Uh, if you want to read a little bit more from another, you know, from an unbiased source of what it's like to fly down there, there's an interesting article. Now, there's some other services that we have. We have an interactive website, uh, and on there we have a map where you can go to and you mouse and click on uh, one of those airports, and it'll tell you what there is to do there. Uh, we also have a weather page where we have uh, programmed all the links for you. So if you're traveling in Mexico and, and can get access to an Internet cafe, go to our website, click weather. It's all free, and you can get Mexican Doppler radar, uh, surface analysis, uh, international SIGMETs, et cetera. And then we have useful links to get your decal, uh, FCC license, all the things that we talked about. And then a pilot shop, uh, you can buy our pilot guide and the necessary charts to travel there. 
Uh, one of the things that we did because there was so much conflicting information is produce the pilot's guide. And right now our territory goes from the Texas border around the Gulf, the eastern part of Mexico and the entire Yucatan Peninsula. And it contains general information, who to tip, who not to tip, uh, what to do before departure, entering Mexico, the whole process. Basically everything that we've talked about today but in much more detail uh, takes you by the hand through the whole process, differences in airspace. Shows you the most common documents and how to fill them out. Airports of entry that we verify personally uh, and some useful information in emergencies. Airport information, we show you where the uh, general aviation ramps are, the buildings, what kind of fuels available, method of payment, services at the airport, aerial shots to help you acquire the runway, a shot of the building that you need to go to once you're on the ground and a sketch of the building, and very important, where the bathrooms are. After a long trip, that can be probably the most useful piece of information on any uh, uh, airport diagram. One of the things that we do are fly-ins, which are guided tours. Uh, we meet the group in the United States and escort you through the trip. We select the accommodations. Uh, we provide most of the meals. We leave some open for people to go uh, explore on their own. All the transportation from the airport, group activities, entrance fees, equipment, anything that's required, and then special farewell uh, dinners. Um, we think it's important to speak the language, which we do, and understand the culture. We want you to leave with more than a sunburn, so we try to always in integrate the cultural aspect into the trip. And we pick out all of the hotels and restaurants uh, ourselves. And we'll work with ATC uh, to make sure that our uh, fly-ins are being monitored uh, by them. And again, for us living in Mexico, flying to and within Mexico is as natural for us as it is for you traveling to and from your uh, local airport. We also do vacation planning services for people that want to do it on their own. We can do a lot of that stuff. We just don't go with you. You just tell us what you want to do, when you want to go, and what type of accommodations um, that you want. So with that, I'd like to take the remaining minutes and answer uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, if you want more info, you can also come by Hangar A, Booth 80, where we're located, but I'd like to open it to questions. Yes, sir. Concerning the 12 inch N numbers, I just have a small one. Concerning the 12 inch N numbers, uh, we just have the small ones. Would something temporary like uh, black duct tape work? Yes, the answer is yes. You can use temporary uh, duct tape. Try to make it look as professional as possible, uh, just so that, because I've seen sometimes they look at it a little bit funny, but yes. Uh, We've, we've seen people use it, it's not a problem. Yes, sir. Could you say something about maintenance at any of the AOEs? What kind of maintenance facility they might have down uh, there? Maintenance facilities at AOEs, uh, it really depends which one. Some have uh, US A&Ps, uh, US registered A&P, Mexican A&Ps, but with a US A&P, and some have, don't even have a hangar. Um, so it really depends on which one. What we do is if you have a problem, uh, and like in our vacation planning, we give you a 24-hour number. Depending where you are and what kind of problem, we can try to, we'll get help moving to you. Uh, we can, we'll find the parts in Mexico that are yellow tagged, and if necessary, we'll have them imported from the U.S., either from, a, if it's a special airplane from whoever you get it from, or from Banyan Air Service in Fort Lauderdale. You, you were in hangar A? Booth 80. 80, thank yep. you. Any other questions? Well, I hope that means I answered them. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I hope it was uh, beneficial. Again, I want to thank the FAA production studio staff. Uh, they're wonderful to work with, as always. And if you, some, if you think of anything else, give us a call. Visit our website. Uh, and most of that information, the, the weather information is free. So even if you're not on one of our trips, please uh, take advantage of it. Okay, thank you. Okay. I got it in an hour. <laughs>